Let's worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of all creation. Come on, go ahead and worship him. Amen. How many of you believe that God is the God of all creation? And there is none like him. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, I believe that you are the God of all creation. And there is none else. You are great, yes you are, Holy One. You walked upon the seas, you raised the dead. You reign in majesty, mighty God. Everything, everything, everything written about you is great. You are great, yes you are. You are great, yes you are. Holy one. You walked upon the seas. You raised the dead. Oh, you reign in majesty. Mighty God. Tremble at your presence. Demons tremble at your presence. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Everything, everything, everything we tell about. Father, we worship you. We thank you. We adore you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. Be exalted forevermore. As we go into your word, we pray, Lord God, that you speak to us in the name of Jesus Christ. At the end of everything, let your name alone be glorified. Thank you because you have answered in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's have a seat in God's presence. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. The title of our message will be taken from um, the discussion we had last week. It was a discussion between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So one of the key things that Jesus discussed with her, and this will be centered on worship. And so the title of this message is True Worship. Somebody say True Worship. So John chapter 4, verse 23, verses 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. Or God is spirit, capital S. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. True worship. True worship entails consecration to God. Consecration of oneself to God. That is absolute yieldedness to God's ways. True worship involves being.
being single hearted. Facing one direction. Doing one thing. Totally committed to God and to him alone. Hallelujah. True worship also entails obedience to the word of God or his commandments. Total obedience. It's either you obey absolutely or not. 99% obedience is disobedience. Hallelujah. So true worship entails absolute obedience to God, to his commandment, to his word, to his commandment. True worship entails being set apart, consecrated, being set apart, holy. That is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. That is the whole of your being, the whole of your life is set apart for God's use. Hallelujah. True worship stems from the heart. So it moves beyond the lips. Yes, it can flow through the lips. Because from the abundance, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? The mouth speaks. Matthew chapter 12. Yeah, is it? Yeah, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. That was Jesus talking. From the, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. So true worship flows beyond the lips. There are some worships that are only coming out from the lips. They call it lip worship. It can come in form of a song. That is where it, that's where it ends. It can come in form of uh, entertainment. Yeah, performance, show, is all show. Hallelujah. So, real worship goes beyond song. Even though it can come out in a song, in form of a song. You know, one of the questions I ask is that, look, when we sing, I love people singing. I, I, I love music. I love music. I like it when people sing and they play and they do all, you know, and particularly when people want to give testimony and they come and sing. And then, now, the question is, do you sing like that in your closet? Between you and God, from your heart. That's where true worship starts from. It comes from the heart. Not because somebody is looking at it. It doesn't matter whether you are alone, whether you are two, whether you are ten, whether you are one thousand. It's between you and God. Hallelujah. So it flows beyond the lips. It comes from the heart. So I want to take us back to the discussion that Jesus had with a woman of Samaria. We discussed this last week. I want to take us back to that discussion and we are only going to be looking at the area of worship. I read from verse 23, but I want to backtrack a bit to verse 21. Jesus said to the woman, the time is coming when worship will no longer be limited to geographical location. Hallelujah. Please, let's pay attention. In fact, that's the reason why you are here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, worship 
You know, Jesus was bringing a new dimension into worship. He was, he was bringing disruption. He was revolutionizing the subject of worship. Before, it used to be whether in Mount Gerizim or Mount Zion in Jerusalem. You know, that, that, the woman was vast. She was, in she was in tune with the convention. <laughs> but Jesus was not just going to flow with the convention. He would break everything breakable in order to bring the order of God to being. Hallelujah. So he said, look, you know what the man said? Our fathers worship on this mountain. You say this and this and that. So Jesus now, what he did was, like I said, just to shatter existing. Now, he, he, he didn't come to destroy things, though, but he came to bring about a shaking. That was why I said, look, don't think I've come to bring peace. The prince of peace. Okay, I'm already digressing into other things. That, exactly the same thing. He brought it about worship. Ah, it's only on this mountain. If you go to a uh, mountain of uh, this, mountain of that, that is where it's all on thing bad run here. If it bad alone back, we see no. Hallelujah. So he said, the hour cometh when you shall neither on this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Does it mean God is not in Mount Gerizim or God is not in Jerusalem? No. What he's trying to say is that God can never be limited to one place. Is the omnipresent God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So real worship will spring from the heart. That's what Jesus was trying to say here. Now, now, we had clips of this in the Old Testament. Too. Because people like David already, you know, he's dropped into New Testament age. He saw it afar. So David will say, the sacrifice that is acceptable unto the Lord, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. So David knew, or maybe he had a bit of the, of, the, of the syllabus of things to come. Hallelujah. So he said, look, it's in the heart. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So he said, real worship comes from the abundance of the earth. And that's why the Bible says he said keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. So if you are going to worship the Father, it's from the heart. If you are going to worship another object apart from the Father, it's from the heart. If there's going to be a dilution in your heart, it's from the heart. Or about worship. If you are going to worship self, you worship men, you worship the devil, it's still from the heart. So he says, keep your heart. That's your sanctuary. That's what makes you either the sanctuary of God or the sanctuary of the devil. Hallelujah. I want you to tell somebody, keep your heart with all diligence. Amen. So, true worship breaks geographical barriers. It decentral, like I put it, it decentralizes worship. You can stand anywhere in your room and worship God. You know, sometimes, well, some people say, uh, you have a particular place, a secret place. Now, secret place that the Bible was talking about is not a secret room. A secret place. It's only you. It's, uh, 
Hallelujah. No. The idea of the secret place means entering into the closet with God, being with God, being alone with God. You can be in the midst of multitude and be alone with God. You can be in the office and be alone and connect with God. You can be in the car traveling with people and be alone with God. And you can be alone and be, and your heart will represent multitude, multitude of floods flowing in and flowing out. Hallelujah. So it all involves being still in the presence of God. So that you can receive from him. Amen. Amen. So, in verse 22. Now, Jesus says, you worship what you don't know. But we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Hallelujah. True worship thrives on the knowledge of God. You can't worship the one you don't know. So, for worship to be effective, knowledge is inevitable. But unfortunately, many times people worship an unknown God. So that was what Jesus was telling this woman. You worship what you don't know. Yes, you call you say you are worshipping the God of, you know, you are, you are sons of Abraham. You are sons of Isaac. You are sons of um, uh, uh, Jacob. You even call Jacob your father. You worship the God of Jacob. But this God of Jacob, you don't even care to know him. Why? Because there is dilution at that book. You know? You are still, you claim to be worshipping God, but you still have some other things that you worship. For some people, maybe, you know, it's juju. For the new age Christianity, it might not necessarily be juju. But you have some other things that are sharing the space of your heart with God. So, you are worshipping an unknown God. Hallelujah. So, Jesus said, you worship what you do not know. That is, worshipping an unknown God. In Acts chapter 17, in Athens, Apostle Paul went to a place called Mars Hill, Areopagos, and he was addressing the people. He said, oh, yes, I know, beyond reasonable doubt, you men of Athens, you are religious. Hallelujah. You are superstitious, according to the King James Version. You know, that is, they, they, they had a sense of religion. Yeah. They had a sense of religion. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm trying to locate it here so that I can read it for us. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. Then Paul stood in the midst of my hills, Mars hill, and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. Yes, I know you are religious. I know you call upon God. He said, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar. Somebody say altar. Mm -hmm. We glorify altar. But the real altar is not physical. True worshippers have an altar before God. It's not physical altar. It's the sanctity of their heart. Amen. You know, we so much try to place importance on physical things. Ah, don't go there like the altar here now. The essence of this altar now is for everybody to see me. Of course, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean they should now be littering the whole place. Hallelujah. But the real altar is in your heart. 
Amen. 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 So he said, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Let me stop there. You can read. It's very interesting. You can read the whole, the uh, next few verses. Hallelujah. Apostle Paul was introducing something to these guys here. Look. Worship is not about all these things that you are doing. The God of heavens. He said, look, you don't have to grope in the dark to look for him. He's not lost. He's right beside you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So true worship involves or thrives on the knowledge of God. Knowing the only true God. Jesus said that this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. True worship is different from vain worship. Let me quickly give, you know, say one or two things about vain worship. Isaiah spoke about vain worship. In Isaiah chapter 29, vain worship is very, very common in our days. That if you are not in tune with the Spirit of God, you will get it mixed up and you will get carried away. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much, oh, maybe we should read it together. Hallelujah. Are we there? Uh, please open it. I'll wait for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isaiah is in Old Testament. We know that. Hallelujah. So we are there, right? Okay. One, two, three, go. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near me, with their and with their do not honor me but have and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men hallelujah you see they teach about the fear of god they sing they dance but one thing is missing is not from their heart they talk about the fear of God. They preach about the fear of God. They do everything. They sing to God. They worship God. They do everything. But it's not coming from the heart. So he said it is lip service. It is vain worship. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at... Isaiah was talking about the people here. He was talking about the blindness of Israel. The people of Israel in his days. But it was also a prophetic utterance that Jesus made reference to concerning vain worship. Matthew chapter 15. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. We are going to read it. Too. Amen. Amen. Okay. Please, I want everybody to read together with a loud voice. So, it's, me, it's not me that is saying this. You will say it with your mouth. One, two, three, go. Ah, no, wait, wait, wait. Just few people are reading. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Emma Beru. Amen. One, two, three, go. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh. Or to me with their mouth and honored me with their lips, but their heart is hallelujah. So, where does real worship start from? Draw near unto the Lord, let your heart draw near to Him. 
That's a very good starting point. He says, as far, as long as your heart is far away from me, what you do physically and people see, please get it right. The voice of men is the voice of God. It's not true, sir. Oh, let everybody see what you are doing so that people will give good testimonies. Am I against the testimonies of people? No. But of what good is it when everybody is seeing what you are doing on the surface, but it, it's totally different from what God sees? Hallelujah. Real worship starts or tribes on the knowledge of God. Real worshippers knows the one whom they worship. So Jesus said, we know who we worship. And somebody would think he's just talking about the Jews. Yes, he was talking about the Jews, but not, he wasn't representing all the Jews. Because even Apostle Paul came later in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. He said, the real Jew is not the one that is Jew outwardly. That is, being a Jew is that which is inward. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. And, but he is the one, you know, the one that is inward. Whose service does not command the praise of men, but of God. Maybe I should quickly look at that because the way some people are looking at me as if I'm manufacturing this thing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 2, verse 28. He said, He, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of, hallelujah, of God. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus was saying, salvation is of the Jews. That is, salvation begins from the Jews. Because unto the Jews were committed the oracles of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 2. Hallelujah. So Jesus moves on from there. He said the time cometh, And now is. So that, you know, in verse 21, he said the time is coming. If you look at it, if you read it very well. Mark, uh, John chapter 4. Verse 21, he just said, the time is coming. But in verse 23, he said, the time cometh and now is. The hour cometh. That is, the time is coming. And in fact, it is here. So that is, he, Jesus was introducing a new era. A new season. That is not only is that kind coming. We are already in that season now. Wake up and smell the coffee. It's not going to come in 10 years time. It's not going to come in 6 months time. We are already in that season. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He said when the true worshippers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. When the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He said, for God seeks such people to worship him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. True worship is done only to the Father. Only to the Father. It doesn't have to be appealing. That fact or that truth, that reality, it doesn't need to gain popular uh, attention or people uh, believe in it. It doesn't matter. But that's the truth. It's a hard fact. It doesn't have to be popular. True worship 
only belongs to the Father. It is done only to the Father and none else. Not to your children. Not to your spouse. Not to your parents. Not even to your mentor. God alone. You can honor men. You can respect men. But worship is to God alone. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Jesus, when the devil came to tempt him, Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, Luke chapter 4 verse 8, he said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only will you serve. That's true worship. In spirit and in truth said we are already in that season woman and I'm telling you today people of God we are already in that season I don't know maybe we need to change our orientation our perspectives about the worship of God Everybody has one or two reasons why they come to church every Sunday. But if it is to worship God, please, I beg you. And I want you to know something. That that's part of worship. You have come not to gist. Whatever gist you want to do can take place after the service. You have come with the maker of your life, to meet the maker of your life, your, your maker, your creator. He is the one that can shape on your life. Why not just give it all it takes? You woke up very early, dressed up, you know, put on nice clothes. Some of you drove all the way down. Some of you had to take public transport and you came here. No opportunity to meet with God, to have an encounter with Jesus. My goodness, don't let the devil outsmart you. Every other thing, every other thing is secondary. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So it is done in spirit and in truth, that is wholeheartedly, it will consume the whole of your being, the totality of your life. And let me tell you, true worship determines what you do. True worship to God, you cannot separate it from your career. You cannot separate true worship to God from your lifestyle. You cannot say I'm a true worshiper but this is the kind of cloth that is trending in my generation because I want to trend. Hallelujah. No. What is the value system of the God that you have totally yielded your life to? That is what you exhibit. No matter what is happening in the world around you. You are the one that, no, okay, fine, that's what you want. But this is what my own God has told me to live by. That's true worship. So it's not trying to, trying to adjust to what the world is bringing to you. No. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You remember the song? Haba, what make you smile? Hallelujah. How can you make God smile? Your heart, your lifestyle. This is what my goons are doing. So, <laughs> when we are gisting, I don't want to make them see me as a little Eric but if they will laugh at you because of your stand for God, let them laugh at you. While people are mocking you 
and laughing at you, heaven is celebrating you. And Jesus said, look, great is your reward. Rejoice exceedingly. In fact, when people laugh at me for doing the right thing, ah, I bury a Jesara. I, I, yes, I go back to, ah, thank you, Lord. Even sometimes, as humans, you feel pain, especially when they persecute you. But there is this assurance that you get that, oh, for doing the right thing, come on. You are making God smile. That's the only way. It's not by singing. Ah, the way some people are looking at me this morning. Hallelujah. Maybe I should just close this uh, sermon. Amen. Or oh, I should change the topic, sir. Avisa. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God will bless you. Amen. Amen. God will bless every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, and Jesus went further. He said, God is spirit. He said, oh, before that, he said, the Father. So, you see, there are some people that God seeks. There are some, he said, God seeks people. So, there are people that will worship God. There are some people that their cry is like the barking of a dog before God. Meanwhile, there are some people that their cry, their song, their worship, even their praise, their prayer is like a sweet smelling savour. Hey, bring it on, my son, come on. Ah, I've been waiting to, you know, we sing that song. You know the song? Yeah. The only, the food that God will eat, that I don't know when, they, I don't know. Hallelujah. If truly, Okwe is the food of God. So when we don't praise him, that means God will starve, Abby. <laughs> okay, let's not go there. Somebody is already saying, ah, this man, you have come again. Hallelujah. Yeah, God loves our praise, He'll, but whether we praise him or not, he's God. He can never be. So if Okwe is actually his food, that means if we, sometimes we just, ah, well, I don't want to. That means God will stop. God can never be limited. Hallelujah. But God desires the worship of people who worship him in spirit and in truth. They worship him because he's God. It doesn't matter what happens around them, even in the midst of tribulation, even when they are in need, when they are going through challenges, they will still come and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. He said, God desires such to worship him. By the way, the reason for our existence is to worship God. He is a needless God. He doesn't need anything. But we need him. Hallelujah. And the only thing we can fulfill our purpose, our only purpose on earth, whether you are an accountant or IT professional, engineer, doctor, pastor, apostle, whoever. One job that you have on earth is to worship the Father. Hallelujah. And that's what determines whether you succeed or fail in life. Even in your career. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Jesus went. He said God is a spirit. Somebody say God is spirit. God is spirit. God is not man. You know. This. Statement. Every day of our lives. Let it keep ringing. God is spirit. Because sometimes we behave as though God were man or mortal. God is not flesh. That's why the Bible says, he is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. God is spirit. Hallelujah. And those who worship him must not might, not may. Must. If you are going to be a worshiper, 
if you are going to worship God, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. There is no way you can worship God who is a spirit if you are not in the spirit. If you don't have a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you cannot worship God because he is spirit. You cannot worship him in the flesh. So the songs and everything that we sing to God and the prayer that we offer to him and whatever it is that we want to give to him in times of what must emanate from the heart. Our lifestyle, everything. It must be about pleasing God. Hallelujah. So he said, whoever must worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. God will help me. I still have some things to say here, but as the Holy Spirit enables. So true worshipers are in sync with the Holy Spirit. Quickly, go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. He was talking about worship here also. Philippians chapter 3. He said, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Who rejoice in Christ Jesus. Who have no confidence in the flesh. Now, where was Paul when he was writing this letter? He was in the prison. He was in the prison. He said, we are the real circumcision. Like we read in, Pro, uh, in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 20. Circumcision is not of the flesh. Even though when God made the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, he started with cutting away of the foreskin. But it was, you know, it had a deeper spiritual significance. So the real circumcision is of the heart. So he said, we are the circumcision, the real circumcision, the real Jews, the real sons and daughters of God are the people that worship in the spirit. They rejoice in Christ Jesus, even in the midst of tribulation. And they have no confidence in the flesh, not in their bank account, not in their degree, not in their investment, not in their career, not in their marriage, not in their godfathers, but they have God as the father. Hallelujah. True worship immunizes you against the devices or vices or entrapment of Babylon. One of the definitions I gave about true worship, consecrating yourself, being set apart for God's use. So, you, you, you know, you see that immediately. And when you see something that looks like it, but is fake, you will know from afar. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were in Babylon. And they saw an offer, a tempting offer, lovely offer. People were being recruited. But fine, it's good. And they put, you know, they were chosen. They were chosen. And there came another offer. Delicacies and all the good, good things. But it will contaminate what they carried. And they were able to see that. Why? Because they were consecrated. Ah, we will get into trouble. If we go for this, they said no. <laughs> no, we would rather stay on God's lane. So true worship immunizes you from the pandemic of the devil. They call it pand it's pandemic. Hallelujah. If you know, you know what I'm saying. Amen. It's Babylon entrapment. And a lot of people 
all in the name of Christianity are falling into it. Be careful. And I believe this is a timely message to us this morning. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Amen. True worship will most likely or most definitely rob you of comfort and convenience at least for a season. Uh, let, let me just so that it won't look too hard at least for a season. It depends on God's syllabus at least at least for a season. When you are engaged in true worship, you will endure. Some people don't like. No, it's not. You don't endure. You enjoy. Eh? You are welcome, sir. If you are going to be a worshiper of God, you will endure. The Bible says endure hardness as a soldier. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, that is, when he became old, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches. Imagine Omoba, someone who was trained in the king's palace. He saw reproach of Christ as better riches. What do you call riches? What are the things you call riches? Hallelujah. You can't be a true worshiper and be, and be involved in profiteering, racketeering, round tripping, making, taking on due advantage of the system, whether the, econ- the, the, the society or even people. And that's where you are getting your wealth from. No. I want to believe there is none like that in this house. And if there is, stop it. Hallelujah. So esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Hallelujah. Ah, Let me, before I close, I still have a couple of things to say, but I just have to. Some of the rewards of true worship that worshipers in spirit and in truth get. I have just about four here. A crown of righteousness, that's number one. As a true worshiper, apart from all the things you get here, but, you know, your worship unto God has eternal reward. The crown of righteousness. That's, uh, I think that's found in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Apostle Paul was talking about a crown that has been laid for him, which the Lord will give unto everyone that loves him. So, the crown of righteousness. The second, the crown of life. Blessed is he that endures persecution or tribulation. For the Lord will give unto him the crown of life which he has promised to them that love him. That's James chapter 1 verse 12. And also the incorruptible crown. That's number 3. First Corinthians chapter 9 verse 25. Apostle Paul was talking about people that run in a race they get eternal reward. Perishable reward. But, but for those who are running the heavenly race they get eternal reward, the crown of incorruptibility. Hallelujah. The incorruptible 
crown. That's what he put. That's how he puts it. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-five. The first one, a crown of righteousness. Second Timothy chapter four, verses seven and eight. The second one, the crown of life. James chapter one, verse twelve. The third one, the incorruptible crown. First Corinthians chapter nine verse 25, and the fourth one, the crown of glory, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Peter was talking about the overseers, the people in charge of others, that they should lead the people, they should feed the flock, they should do everything in accordance with the will of the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, that at his appearing, he will give unto them the crown of glory. Hallelujah. The power and the grace to worship God in truth and in spirit. I pray the Lord will grant unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We appreciate you for your word. We bless your name for all that you have done for us. And we pray that you grant unto us the heart, the spirit of worship, true worship, real worship to the Father and no one else. And we ask, because there is no way we can worship without knowing you. Henceforth, we don't want to serve an unknown God again. Help us to know you. Help us to know you. Help us to grow in the knowledge of you that we may offer a reasonable service unto you. Thank you because you have answered in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.